yeah, welcome. Nice to have some people around here after lunch, which is always not that easy. This is one of those low time points in conferences. People have gone to lunch and come back, are having coffee, etc. Um, I work. I'm Adrian. I work for Egalia, which is a small, well, not so small, medium size. I would say uh, free software boutique consultancy. I would say because we do very specialized work uh, on request. And uh, even when we don't say it much in our website, we have been doing embedded work since 2004. Uh, some of the, my colleagues have been working in my MO since the times of the N700. So we come a long way from doing embedded work. And, uh, and yeah, and I, I think we can, well, we can say that we do embedded even if it's not said in the website that much or those kind of things. Um, today I'm going to talk uh, to you about a small project, well, small, not so small project uh, that we did uh, in collaboration with uh, MIPS Technologies just right before they were acquired by Imagination uh, by the end of 2013, uh, sorry, end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Um, and the challenge that uh, we were faced with was to make a WebKit, cute WebKit uh, browser uh, work faster and render faster in an embedded device uh, using a quite limited embedded platform in the sense that it didn't have much memory. Uh, it did have a GPU, but it was not accessible to the main Linux system that was running the applications or certain applications. And it was uh, not super fast, MIPS 70K, 74K, but still, well, had to be done somehow. And it's not that, that, that small uh, browsers used to run in the past in smaller things. So of course, uh, there was some browser application already working. The challenge was to make it not so slow. Um, the neat thing, and this is something I was commenting with the MIPS guys over there, um, of the MIPS 70K, it's, uh, it's like a classic MIPS processor which for me personally has a very special place in my heart. It was the first processors I have learned to program in Assembler. Uh, so I just signed up for this project. Yeah, I want to do it. Looks fun. And challenging also. And uh, those ones come with an FPU, an M a memory management unit, and a DSP unit. I, and I make air quotes because I'm going to explain that it's not exactly a DSP di digital signal processor. And uh, it's neat that it comes with all this because uh, the MIPS CPUs are designed in such a way that you can actually provide a very basic core without FPU, for example, and then if you want, you can attach your own coprocessors. A very good example is the PlayStation 1, which had a MIPS 3000A without FPU, but then Sony had their coprocessor to make uh, triangle operations for the graphics. So it was kind of a funny thing. Um, and I was making air quotes with the DSP. That's not really a DSP in those uh, processors. What is there is a series of instructions that work on the pre-existing uh, processor registers and work in a single instruction, multiple data fashion, which is quite suitable for signal processing in general. That's what I guess the name comes from, call it DSP. And uh, of course, including signal processing that goes with audio and video, etc. And this came up very handy to actually reach the goals we have. So can we use this for, to improve the performance? Yes, of course we can, and we did. Um, and with every performance improvement project, what one has to do is always measure things a lot. Because if you don't have reference numbers, you cannot tell uh, we have improved by 10%, 5%, or anything. Uh, and it's sometimes not easy to do those measurements. So, um, yeah, with that in mind, uh, with, we, we first have to think how to measure things in this particular platform, uh, and then decide what to optimize and where. Regarding what to optimize, uh, there was, of course, a bottleneck for video and audio, which uh, one of my colleagues has been 
working on improving. And then the, we identified that one of the main issues was the rendering pipeline in the software Qt Painter. So that was the target of the, of the improvements. And it was good that it was that way because being in Qt, that meant that uh, we could also not just improve WebKit, but we could improve Qt uh, and this streamer for audio, audio and video because the Qt WebKit uses, well, used to use this streamer. Um, so improving this streamer, how this streamer does the decoding and how Qt uh, does the drawing, we can not only improve this particular case of a browser using Qt WebKit, but any application that is running in the same, um, same range of devices that uses Qt, which is great. And as we always in engineers like to do, if we make it more generic, the better. So also, those things are good candidates for single instruction, multiple data code, as I was commenting. So it was a very good fit to use uh, this uh, digital signal processor instructions from those uh, processors to optimize this code. Uh, in this uh, particular small platform we had to work with, we had some limitations. And uh, the main ones were regarding tooling support. Uh, the problem with certain embedded platforms is that even when they may be running Linux or some well-known system, uh, you may not have the tools you're used to work with. In this case, we couldn't run the GTB directly in the board. There was no Balgrind. It had a kind of old kernel, so there was no perf and no access to performance counters. We tried to patch up the kernel to add a small driver to support reading those, but we couldn't kind of uh, figure out exactly where the kernel headers came from to make a matching model that would build and run in the kernel. So we ended up uh, coming up with or trying to come up with uh, different sol solutions, some of them a bit ad hoc. So for development, we have used QEMU, which is nice. You have it local in your computer. You do your code, verify that your algorithms are working as expected. And then with the GDB server, we could actually run code on the machine and debug it remotely. And that was very, very useful. And uh, we patched Google Perf tools to be able to make profiling. There was a half working patch uh, in a, attached to a bug report that we could get running after some changes. And uh, then for measuring rendering times, uh, we used the process CPU time, real time clock from POSIX, which Linux supports since 2632, I think. Um, and it's very nice because it's not just that you're measuring wall clock time, you're measuring the CPU time slices used by your particular process. So it's much more accurate uh, to do this kind of performance measurements, not as good as using performance counters, which those processors support, but still quite good. And uh, we could get quite accurate um, measurements. <clears throat> quite accurate, but still, there was a couple of issues we had. Oh, another one uh, is that GNU time is usually forgotten. People tend to use just time without typing slash user slash being slash time. And you get the time that comes with your shell, which is built in and usually lacks some, lacks some features. And one very nice feature that GNU time has is measuring the, um, gives you um, the, the count of page faults that your code made, which is, uh, especially when dealing with big amounts of data, like video or images, it can make a difference if you try to optimize the number of page faults that your code generates or not. So this was very useful for that. And then I was saying that one has to be careful with the timing measurements, and the, the per CPU process time clock works nicely, but sometimes, depending on the kernel versions and the particular platform and how well it is implemented, uh, how, how good is the platform support, uh, the resolution advertised by the timer may not be uh, as good as the actual one uh, that you get when 
measuring it in your code. So we have to go some extra hoops to measure the, the latency, uh, sorry, the difference of uh, theoretical and actual resolution, and, this, and sometimes retry tests if some, if, when the clock was not acting perfectly. Um, and because uh, it was not, we didn't have the source uh, of the browser application that came with this particular um, platform. Uh, I developed a small tool that uh, inter uh, has actually the ability to control the Google Perf Tools profiler. So it can detect when uh, it is preloaded and it start to run the profiler uh, and to make the sampling uh, only after all the resources of a web page and the layout has been done internally and uh, when you are, so it measures only the actual rendering uh, time and it doesn't uh, measure uh, resource loading from the net network or from local files or whatever. And this was actually very nice to have and what made it actually possible to get good measurements for uh, rendering performance. Uh, well, also, there's a lot of scripts we have to make to pick all those raw uh, data and uh, crunch it a bit and get many meaningful results and uh, try to visualize how things were working. And, uh, well, there's a lot of mixed, mixed things with some shell scripts, some Python, some Perl, uh, some crazy scripts to change the paths, the relative paths in the Google Perf tools uh, traces because uh, we didn't have the debug versions of the libraries in the, in the machine, but we could make a split debug versions of the libraries and have the, the, um, the debugging symbols locally in our laptops, but then not in the target platform. So we had to, well, shuffle things a bit around uh, to get Google Perf tools working, but it did in the end. Um, and regarding the kind of things uh, we have done, I have a detailed example, well, kind of detailed example, of the kind of optimizations uh, I have been doing, um, which go a bit like this. This is uh, not a, a graphics operation. Uh, it's a stream conversion from ASCII to UTF-16, which is the internal representation that Qt used for all its strings. And, uh, I'm going to use this because it's probably the smallest example one can come up with, and we also, as I'm going to mention later, we also ended up doing some optimizations in string operations. So uh, one starts with a small thing in C. In this case, it's just a very simple pull-up that picks an integer paths with zeros in the left and saves it back. Uh, and actually, the compiler generates pretty decent code for this. But it can be better because the compiler is not aware of the existence, for example, of instructions to unpack bytes in half words or half words in, in a word and these kind of things that uh, the DSP instructions uh, support. So starting from this, uh, the usual workflow was to write a version in assembler without any kind of optimization, without any kind of usage of uh, the DSP instructions and then start building up from that, adding things like loop and rolling and alignment of input and output data and these kind of things. So as a first step, I would always start with a, with a small, simple version of the algorithm. Then try to improve the memory access patterns. In this case, uh, if you see there, instead of loading just uh, one byte at a time, uh, it loads one word at a time, so it loads four bytes. And actually, in, in most of the platforms, uh, reading four bytes is faster than reading a byte, because when you read a byte, you read a whole word, then you dis uh, discard three bytes. But this way, you have the four bytes already loaded, and you can shuffle them around, like in this version here. You can shuffle them around, and shuffling the, byte, the, the bytes around to put them in the proper places and then store them is actually faster than the code that the compiler generates that just loads a byte and stores a short. Because the memory is very devilish and it's way faster than doing all this here in the middle. So the next step would be 
And now that I have this, can I reduce further the number of instructions? Can I reorder them in such a way that uh, the pipeline of the processor stalls less? Or can I use some of those uh, single instruction multiple data operations? And usually the answer would be, of course, yes. You can just reduce 10 instructions, for example, that mingle bits around and put them in two single instructions that unpack uh, bytes in half words. So, goal achieved. No, not really. Because now that we don't have all the 10 instructions in the middle, what is going to happen is that the, um, the, code, the, the data dependencies in the code, this value loaded here that then is used here, uh, actually the, the processor is going to stop there and add some bubbles, some empty space in the pipeline, because it's waiting for the memory instruction to actually fetch the data. So, the next step is to try to avoid these kind of cases. And the most common way of doing it is uh, unrolling the loop manually. So you can, uh, for example, launch four uh, load instructions in parallel to four, uh, to four different registers. And then start, um, after, after the fourth load instruction, you start moving the bytes around and doing your actual processing of the data. Because the instructions added in the middle uh, fill up the gaps in the pipeline. I don't, actually, I don't actually have a diagram of that. I'm really sorry. Uh, but at least for this case, uh, it was needed to at least unroll the loop four times and repeat the body of the loop four times to avoid uh, the data dependencies be, uh, making the pipeline to stall the execution in the processor. And uh, then there's another a small thing that is, it may not be immediately recognized, but if I'm loading a word at a time, so that's four bytes, in something that is a string that is byte by byte, it may happen that my function is going to get past an address that is not divisible by four, which is not word aligned, and that is going to cause a trap, and either abort the execution, or if the kernel has support for it, the kernel is going to handle the trap and give the data. But that's horribly, horribly, horribly slow. It's one of the slowest things that, ha that can happen. So if we do not take care of making sure that this address there is aligned to a word boundary, we're going to do even worse than the compiler. And that's also one of the things uh, that was taken care about. So in most of the cases, uh, we would end up with a version, four versions of the algorithm depending on the different alignments or some prefixes prefix code which would ensure that the data would be aligned and then start with the uh, unrolled loop that works on the aligned data. And that's why, once measuring, I have this here, which is different versions of this same, very same algorithm using different, uh, different uh, instructions. There's the C1, there's the simple one, unrolled eight times that loads byte by byte and stores half word by half word. Uh, then I have the last version that I have there with unrolled four times and using the DSP instructions and also unrolled eight times. And it's very interesting to see that in the, with the small input, actually the C version is as good as the assembler version. And this is because the prefix code used to ensure the alignment or to set up the loop uh, is, uh, is taking a toll and not making it be faster, because that's, all, that's some part that is always executed regardless of the input data length. And the bigger gains, of course, are appreciated after a, a certain size of the strings. So even funnier is that the amount of enrolling uh, that, uh, also changes how the algorithm performs. So in the, in the version of the algorithm that is unrolled eight times, which is the brown line, you can see that it, go, it goes making like a saw uh, shape. And, and that's because it goes better when the input is uh, multiples of eight, like eight, eight character strings or 16. But for 12, it does, it does worse because it uh, rever reverts to using the simple loop that is not unrolled. So actually, uh, what this particular function ended up in the final version optimized uh, is a hybrid version that uses uh, the simple 
the simple byte by byte algorithm for small strings that are less than 16 characters, or 20, I think it was. And then from there on, it uses the version that uses a eight times enrolled reading word by word. And this is a pattern that happened in almost every single algorithm we have been optimizing. Most of them, uh, we would need to do different versions depending on the input size of the input size. And, uh, and also taking care of proper alignment of the, both the source and the destinations. Uh, then going already, already into graphics operations, uh, have also an example for alpha blending. And this is mostly to see how the, oops, sorry, to see how the alignment affects the different versions of the algorithms. Uh, as you can see, the, the war, yeah, the, the hybrid version that uses different enrolling steps depending on the input uh, usually works better, as I was saying. And, and in some cases, enrolling more does, uh, does worse for those small sizes. And this is another funny case. Uh, I'm not stopping a lot on the particular code because it's not that relevant for each one of the operations. Um, and I'm talking more about the string functions because the most weird or difficult cases ended up being in those. The graphics operations were more or less, well, they, they took their time, but they're more, they were more or less doable and didn't pose a very big problem to, to optimize. Uh, this is a particular example that I want to mention because this is a Unicode UTF-16 case insensitive comparison. And this was about the trickiest algorithm because uh, in Unicode you have, you have to do case folding, which is a very, quite expensive operation. And it's not easy at all to make an assembler, honestly. And uh, Qt uses, uses this lib ICU lib eq to do Unicode stuff, uh, which is already quite good doing it. Uh, so actually, the implementation for this particular algorithm uh, was passed an extra function pointer, and it would call it from assembler back into C++ to do the case folding, and then do the rest in assembler, because Unicode is very difficult, and I'm going to quote uh, one of the creators of the Lua language, uh, because so every now and then people suggest in the Lua mailing list, well, we sh you should add some Unicode support, and the answer was, well, the problem with Unicode is not that it's bad, is that the Unicode is like general relativity theory. The more you think you understand it, the less you understand it. <laughs> so actually, I, uh, I tried to make case folding in Assembler, I spent weeks on it, and in the end decided to not do it. And still, uh, it was possible to get a measurable improvement in doing the rest of the comparisons um, using assembler code. Um, yeah, so it was, it, it was very interesting. Very interesting. And the thing is also very clear here. I have, like, in this graph I have painted, like, for all the different kinds of alignment, uh, different, uh, the four different algorithms that I made for this particular function. And in almost all the cases, except, um, except totally aligned data, in the rest of the cases, in the small strings, always it would happen that the simple C version would be faster because it avoids all the, all the overhead of trying to arrange the arguments uh, to call assembler, do an external call, maybe the code is in line by the compiler for those simple cases. So in this particular function, <laughs> we ended up with a solution that depending on the size, either uses the C loop or a simple assembler loop or two different versions of the algorithm, which is a bit crazy, but it works quite well. So what's the actual final speed up we get after optimizing uh, most of the QImage and QPainter graphics operations uh, and some of the string functions? Even when 
one by one, the improvement may not be great, or maybe just a 5% improvement, 10% at most for certain functions like alpha blending, which really benefits a lot from these kind of optimizations. Uh, overall, uh, we ha uh, I have run on the Alexa top 100 sites of the time plus a list of sites uh, that were interesting in general because they had complex uh, alpha blendings and different things. Uh, I, I left this, uh, this measurement tool I made, left it running for a couple of days, all, over all this data, and uh, I got this in the end. This measures the performance increase of rendering those, all those websites. And the histogram is made in such a way that uh, um, it picks all the measurements for all the websites, both and without the optimizations enabled, and then uh, those are plotted in a histogram. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the clock, th the clock issue was a bit tricky that made it have some really odd measurements there that I, haven't I have not discarded in this particular version of the graph, so you actually see that one has to be careful with those kind of outliers that then if you go and check manually for the particular websites that, that uh, failed with those really bad performance uh, improvements, or not even improvements, but even going worse, if you do it manually and try it several times, then it happens that it, it was actually not bad. It was actually the clock making funny things. And that's also uh, the same for those cases here below 1.0. 1.0 would be no improvement. Uh, and actually, this is representative of, of the final results. And most of the, most of the websites would render around 10% uh, faster than before uh, implementing the, all those optimizations. Some of the websites would render 20% faster. And some of them, wow, surprise, up to 30% faster, which is really, truly amazing uh, and really difficult to get when you are only doing micro-optimizations in very small algorithms. So in the end, uh, because all those graphics functions are used by Qt all along, and uh, that's quite a, lot, quite a bit of stream processing also in WebKit for certain things like uh, applying CSS properties, for example, it uses dictionaries with the strings, etc. Um, in the end, even when the, for each small independent algorithm, the gains were not that great, when it's all combined and used all over the place to do a rendering of something complex like websites, the more complex the website, the more it would be next to this 30% maximum, maximum speed up we got, which is actually quite cool. So um, I, haven't, I have not been talking much about this, uh, this part of optimizing the org. Uh, library with uh, MIPS DSP instructions. This org library, if you don't know it, is a small library that uh, some of the GStreamer codecs and other, especially media codecs, use. Uh, what it does is it defines a generic kind of macro assembler that you can use to define uh, single instruction multiple data operations in your data, which is something that a lot of video and audio codecs can use. And uh, internally, it has a just-in-time code generator that op tries to optimize for your particular data and the kind of operations you're doing on it. It tries to optimize uh, the machine code it generates. And um, one of my colleagues was working in uh, backend, in, in augmenting the MIPS backend to use those uh, single instruction multiple data operations. Um, I don't have numbers here. But uh, I recall perfectly that uh, the increase of performance went from not being able to watch an MPEG-4 video to be able to watch an MPEG-4 video at 20 frames per second, which is not bad at all, taking into, into account uh, how modest the platform was. So that was actually a very nice thing to do. Uh, so we did, uh, my colleague did that. Uh, then I was doing all those image operations like uh, blend over, surface over, those, those image composition operations for images. Uh, this is a funny one, this, uh, this case. It, there's a lot of G, G, JPEG files on internet, as we know, almost all the images. 
And it happens to be that the libjpeg library decodes then in 24 bit per pixel packed uh, data. So then Qt has to unpack those 24 bit per pixel data into 32 bits per pixel data. And that is, a, that is an operation that is done a lot, a lot all over the place when displaying web pages. So that was also one of the extra uh, non Q image or non Q painter operations that was optimized. And, which, uh, and actually, this one was, uh, along, with, uh, along with alpha blending, was the second one where we got, we got most of the increase of speed. And I was saying alpha permultiplication, cute internally when you are composing images and when you're painting, uses always permultiply data, which is faster to work with blending. And the, the string functions. So quite good. Then also as part of the project was the upstreaming or it was more of a thing that we suggested because we believe that one has to work upstream with almost everything or everything if possible. So uh, we were also trying at the same time to send all, all those patches upstream. And uh, I could say right now this is the status but it has been like this for a while. The lib.org backend has been upstream for several releases already. So if you are doing um, media decoding with GStreamer in a MIPS platform, probably you are benefiting from this code work already. If not, check it and pick one of the latest libork versions. Uh, the Qt part was known initially in Qt 4.8 because this platform was using Qt embedded 4.8. Uh, so I, I actually <laughs> did the patches first for Qt 4.8, but at the time the Qt developers were really in the transition to support Qt 5 and doing the first release. So they were not very interested <laughs> on reviewing patches from Qt 4.8. So they were kind of suggesting, well, if you could maybe forward port them to Qt 5. So I did. And that ended up in Qt 5.2. It took a lot of time to land those patches because uh, I took care of this forward porting and trying to get the patches landed in my free time. But it's there now. Um, and when I say most of the patches are in Qt 5.2, uh, that's only only one small piece missing, and it's the piece that checks at runtime in which processor you are running and enables the optimizations only if your processor supports the new instructions. So now, unless you apply the missing patch manually, it's in the Qt code review in Jared, unless you apply this one, you have to either compile all of Qt with support uh, for MIPS 70K for processors or, be, or better, or you don't have the optimizations. But with uh, this patch that I hope to have at some point soonish also landed, then you can compile most of Qt for generic MIPS 32-bit, compile the few files that have the code for the optimizations with uh, MIPS 70K4 support, and then at runtime Qt will choose which optimizations to use, and will try to enable as many as possible. And because afterwards the project finished, the customer was happy, I already had been in my free time doing the forward port to Qt 5. The patches for Qt 4.8 have been a bit rotting a bit. So at some point I cannot really tell. I may also try to get them back in 4.8 upstream, but there isn't much interest and people are running away from Qt 4 nowadays. So. I don't know if it's going to ever happen, actually. But well, it's, uh, it's, uh, the patches are there still, some version of the patches in Jared. So you may have some luck trying to apply them to one of the last 4.8 <laughs> releases, but I cannot guarantee they would work. Um, and that's about all. Uh, the conclusion, conclusion, I think, most important one is um, even when nowadays embedded platforms are getting more and more powerful, and as uh, Tim was saying the other day in one of the key keynotes, embedded, a phone is not embedded anymore. Well, that's true, because it's crazy powerful how much we are putting in phones, phones nowadays. There's still a lot of applications which are using smaller machines that 
may benefit either removing things like uh, the people from uh, the fast food talks has been telling that you, if you take things away, then of course everything goes faster. Less code is always faster. But when you cannot reduce code, like for example, one doesn't want to ship a browser that doesn't understand CSS, or one doesn't want to ship a browser that doesn't understand uh, PNG images. So then in that case, when you don't have the option of taking more things out, you still have the option of running less code by optimizing the code you uh, write. And this is still, I believe this is still um, a market and, and the need for this kind, of, uh, this kind of projects. And anyway, who doesn't like uh, using less resources, even if it's a very powerful platform, if we are optimizing and getting less code executed in the end, it's also less power consumption, which is also a hot topic nowadays. So if you are considering doing things with a MIPS board and it's going to have some graphics, shiny ones, you can consider Qt5 and I think it's a really solid option and the, the painting performance is quite quite nice, even when just using the software, uh, the software rasterizer. So, any questions? What version of GStreamer were you using? Which version of GStreamer uh, we were using? This was using GStreamer uh, 0.10, because it was, uh, 1.0 was just out of the door at the time, uh, so it was for 0.10, but, uh, because the optimizations were done, done in LibreOrg that GStreamer 1.0 uses also, uh, GStreamer 1.0 would also benefit from the, the improvements. The org optimizations for WebKit, so I let, I might not have understood it correctly. Have you made optimizations to work to use the Mitch platform, or you made optimizations to WebKit to use the org, or both? Okay, uh, yeah, I didn't mention that, it's not clear, he's right. Uh, he's asking if we made optimizations in WebKit, so WebKit uses LibOrg, or we made optimizations in LibOrg because WebKit already uses it. It's the second case, uh, Qt WebKit uses GStreamer for media content, so uh, GStreamer uses LibOrg itself. So we did the optimizations in LibOrg, so they would benefit everything using GStreamer and also uh, WebKit. The idea here was to try to improve the platform as much as possible with, of course, always keeping in mind the goal of having the browser render faster. Uh, but the most proper place to attack the problem was actually in Liborg, where the heavy work is done by GStreamer. The web are using Liborg. Yeah. So they yeah. didn't take advantage of the Mips platform. Uh, 0.10 GStreamer, which is, corresponds with uh, Qt, WebKit 4.8 was already using LibArc at the time. So the patches that you put against WebKit were patches to do SIMD uh, screen functions? Those are actually on Qt. Actually, we didn't touch anything of WebKit. And this is one of the, I think, one of the nicest things from, nicest outcomes from the project. Uh, instead of optimizing in WebKit, because WebKit has this uh, architecture in which it uh, the, each of the ports defines a series of functions that the web core from WebKit hooks into. That means that um, you provide the network functions from your port, so it uses Q network connection, or you provide the painting functions from, to your port, so in Qt it uses, um, it uses Q painter and Q image. So for example, in GTK it would use uh, Cairo, and Cairo would use Pixman, so in that case you would want the optimizations in Pixman, for example. So here we went to the lowest point in the stack that would make the optimization usable by WebKit. Also having in mind the idea of trying to benefit uh, the whole stack. I hope that replies your question. Hmm. Okay, cool. Any other questions? It seems not. Well, thank you very much for attending and uh, I hope uh, you have a nice rest of ELC the rest of the day.